thank you for being here, and uh, we need to just continue to pray about this COVID-19. We've got to get this thing out of here and pray for our president. He's got some big decisions to make. Understand he's going to be doing that on Tuesday. And so if you would, just please hold him up in prayer. He made the statement this would be the biggest decision he's ever made. And so uh, you pray that he'll make the right decision and the people advising him will give him the right information. Grateful today, as I said this morning, we serve a risen Savior. I'm glad to know he's alive, and I'm glad to know that I'm never alone, and he's always with me. And again, thank you for being here today and this morning. Appreciate those that came. Also, if you would, we've already mentioned praying for the Joneses, but put a little picture there in the bulletin of Brother Jones, and truly he's going to be missed. We surely miss him being in the service. We miss all of our people, uh, but uh, we just pray that soon we'll be able to be back together. But when everybody gets back together, it's going to be lonesome without him sitting on the back bench greeting us when we come in. If you have time, take time to write cards or letters to the shut-ins. Let them know that you're praying for them. That'd be a blessing to them. And I know uh, they're, they're the ones, I think, that's having the hardest time through all of this. Uh, people in the hospital and nursing homes not able to see their loved ones and literally having to go it alone. Uh, Joyce Green, she sent a, a note in with her tithe this morning, and she said, Hello, everybody. Miss you all. Send my love and prayers. And that's from Joyce Green. So if you would, remember to pray for her and pray that soon that, that she would be. They're, they're literally confined to their rooms, and um, they don't. the rooms aren't very big. So you can imagine uh, how it is with them. All right. Thank you for being here tonight. As I mentioned, Brother Paul's going to preach in just a few minutes or after the special, but I appreciate him, the help that he's been, and I know you'll enjoy the message. Just, just for the message, Janelle and Drew are going to come sing Resurrection Power.
appreciate that. And he was a little bit nervous. He'd never sang with his mother like that and practice with both the boys this afternoon. Grant's got such a terrible cough from all his allergies, and he's been fighting that for a while and couldn't make it through a song hardly, coughing. And, uh, but I'm glad he did a good job. And he wasn't even, he was nervous about everybody listening to him, and it wasn't even live, see? So you don't have to worry about it, but I uh, appreciate that song. And what a great truth, the resurrections that we're celebrating. You'll find the text this evening in uh, Luke chapter number 24, uh, Luke chapter number 24, and I appreciate the opportunity to preach, of course, and I hope to be a blessing to you, and uh, this is a different day that we're living in, of course, for all of us. And I told my wife the other day, I said, That's, you know, at least if we have to be quarantined at home, at least I can be quarantined with somebody that I like, and she said, well, it must be nice, and... Um, not really, but I think she thinks that sometimes. And the boys, they're homeschooled. They're just going on like normal. So uh, they have, I don't know if they've even noticed yet or not. But uh, anyway, Luke chapter number 24. And we're looking here at the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I'd like to preach on that subject, on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24. Let's read just a couple verses and then we'll pray. And we'll get into the message. Luke 24, beginning in verse number 13. The word of God says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us this evening. Uh, Lord, I stand in the place where flesh will fail me and flesh has failed me. And Lord, I don't want to preach this evening in the power of my flesh or the power of my intellect. But Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I want uh, your spirit to speak to hearts through the preaching of your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to glean something from this passage, just as these disciples on the road to Emmaus uh, glean something from being with you for those few hours. We'll give you the praise and the glory, for we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter number 24, uh, you'll see the majority of the chapter uh, deals with the events of that first Easter Sunday morning, that Resurrection Sunday, uh, when Jesus has come forth from the tomb and uh, he's meeting with Mary and he's meeting with his disciples. And uh, so most of the chapter deals with that day. Just a few verses towards the end of the chapter uh, are at a later date. And we see him interacting with his disciples and in various ways on that resurrection Sunday. And here he interacts for quite a while, really the longest, uh, the longest time he spends with any one group of people... Uh, on this Resurrection Sunday is here on the road to Emmaus. Uh, we just read how that there are two disciples uh, leaving Jerusalem and they're going uh, to this little town of Emmaus. The Bible tells us later that one of them's name is Cleopas or Cleophas. Uh, we think that maybe the other disciple was his wife. There's mention in one of the other gospel records that there was uh, uh, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, was one of the women that was at the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so possibly that was the other disciple. We don't know. But we know that this, one of them was a man by the name of Cleopas. And they are traveling going to Emmaus. They don't know that the resurrection has occurred. They have heard rumors. We'll see that in a moment. But they really don't know what to expect is going to happen in the coming days and the weeks and months of their lives. They have no idea uh, what is about to transpire. On the walk, of course, they had a lot to talk about. The Bible says there is it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, it says they were talking about all the things that were going on, all the things surrounding the trial and the crucifixion, the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they have a good walk in front of them. The Bible says here in the verses that we read 
that Ephesus, or Ephesus, excuse me, Emmaus was about three score furlongs away from Jerusalem. Uh, the his, Jewish historian Josephus agrees uh, that Emmaus was about three score furlongs from Jerusalem. The problem is, number one, we don't know where Jerusalem is today. Uh, or not Jerusalem, Emmaus, we know where Jerusalem's at, it's in the same place. Emmaus, we don't know, it's a village that's been lost to history. And also we don't know exactly what they called a furlong. Was it 500 feet? Was it 700 feet? Uh, from what I was been able to read, and I don't know, I'm not an expert, but it was about seven or seven and a half miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And as I was doing some research, I was kind of curious, how long does it take the average person to walk a mile? And the internet, of course, you can't lie on the internet, so it had to be right. It says it takes 12 minutes for the average person to walk a mile. Now, I'm sure these folks were probably in a little bit better shape than average. They walked their entire existence their main mode of transportation was on foot. And so maybe they could have made it a little bit quicker than that. But uh, seven or seven and a half miles would have taken them uh, probably an hour and a half to two hours. And so this entire journey, they're traveling uh, to their village, the city of Emmaus, the town of Emmaus, and talking about what has happened concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, what has happened concerning uh, his death and his burial. There's just a few things in this passage I want to point out to us this evening, and I hope they're a help to us tonight as we consider these disciples on the road to Emmaus. First off, of course, I want us to see the desperation. The desperation. You can see in, in what the, these disciples are saying uh, that they are desperate for some answers. The disciples don't know it, but the Lord Jesus Christ has come to them in verse number 15. The Bible says in verse number 16, but their eyes were holden. That means their eyes were held back or reined in. They could not discern that this was the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they didn't understand that this is who was traveling with them. And so as they're walking, Jesus Christ comes beside them and he asks them a very simple question. He says in verse number 17, what communication, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another? And look at the next phrase, as you walk and are sad. Jesus says, why are you guys so sad? What's going on? Of course he knows. But we can see their disposition here, the desperation. They're sad. They say, oh, don't you know? Cleopas says, don't you know? Haven't you heard about what's been going on in Jerusalem the last few days? And Jesus says, no, I don't know. He, he doesn't really say it that way. He says, what things? Basically, explain them to me. What's going on? And over the next several verses, the disciples relate to him how there was a man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who they had hoped to be the Messiah, the Savior, and they hoped that he would be the consolation of Israel. They hoped that he would be the one to restore the kingdom. But he was put to trial and he was put to death. And now it's been three days. Whenever I read this passage, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't, but I always think about that book, uh, Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. And at some point in that book, they're having a big elaborate funeral for Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn and in the back doors they walk. You remember that? I can imagine Jesus walking with them and he is hearing the account of his crucifixion from them, and no doubt uh, they are heartbroken. We can feel the desperation. Look what they say in verse, 20, verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They said, we put every, all our faith, all our trust in this Jesus of Nazareth, but now he's dead. What great desperation. As far as they know, he is gone forever. They had no reason to believe otherwise. They did not understand the scriptures uh, that prophesied his death. They did not understand his speaking that prophesied his resurrection. They were confused and they were desperate. And to add to that, now there were people saying that Jesus was alive again. How could this be? This doesn't make sense to them. Look at what it says in verse 22. 
Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Now, it is our natural inclination to be a little bit skeptical about these people. But I want us to put our minds in the minds of these disciples. They saw Jesus die. If it's true that this Cleopas is the same Cleophas that's mentioned in the gospel records that his wife Mary was standing with the other women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the crucifixion. She knew without a doubt that he was dead. She knew that they had put him in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. They knew that he was wrapped in burial clothes and he was being guarded by Roman soldiers. They knew that the stone was in front of the tomb and now Someone saying he's alive, it, it just doesn't make sense to them. It's something that does not register as something that could even be true. Uh, it doesn't make sense. They, they knew what had happened. Now, I can imagine these disciples were probably in the middle of the worst few days of their lives. They believed the Messiah was dead. The person they had put their trust in and their faith in and now some of the followers are saying he was alive but they hadn't seen him. They had no proof of that. They were desperate. We see the desperation. Secondly, we see the demonstration. Verse number 25, Jesus speaks. He says unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He said, yeah, you should understand what the Bible says. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You know, I think sometimes, uh, let me say this. Uh, when they finally get done speaking, they speak about Jesus, Jesus begins to speak about himself. I think in my life, I'm guilty sometimes of speaking a lot about Jesus, maybe not even a lot, speaking more about Jesus than I am letting Jesus speak about himself. Let me give you this illustration. Sometimes I've found, many times, it's easier for me to read a commentary on the Word of God than it is to read the Word of God. I could sit down and read a book on prayer, and I like to read, and I read fairly quickly, and I can get through a book uh, fairly easily, and I could sit down and read a book on prayer in just a few short hours, but it's trudgery to spend just a few moments in prayer to God. And sometimes we speak about Jesus, but we don't let Jesus speak about himself. And he begins here in these verses, look at verse number 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus goes all the way back to Moses. You cannot find somebody that's more revered among Jewish people than Moses. He was, uh, you know, one of the first patriarchs. Uh, he was the one that led them out of Egyptian bondage and, and across the Red Sea and through the wilderness for 40 years. He wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and, and Moses is respected. And so uh, Jesus Christ begins all the way back at the beginning of Scripture, all the way back at the beginning of time within the beginning God and starts explaining to them how he was supposed to die, how he was to be buried how he would be resurrected again. And he goes through the word of God. These disciples, just like the rest of the Jewish population, were looking for a king, someone who would restore uh, the kingdom of Israel to its rightful place. But Jesus used scripture to show that first, he had to come as a servant. First, he had to come as the lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. And he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And I submit to you this evening, the most important thing we can know, apart from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the most important thing we can know is the Word of God. It's of utmost importance to know what the Word of God says. It's of utmost importance to know what the Word of God teaches. Even if we look at what the Bible says about itself, it's astounding. Jesus Christ, speaking of his disciples, uh, speaking to the Father, says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the same psalm, he says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Do you realize this evening, uh, the world we're going in is going through a lot of change right now, and a lot of things are being moved around, and businesses are being 
uh, closed and we're having to do church in a different way than we've ever done it before. And I submit to you that the only thing apart from the relationships we make in this whole world that's going to last for eternity is the word of God. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, this precious book I'd rather own than all the golden gems that e'er in monarchs' coffers shone or on their diadems. And if the seas were a chrysolite, the earth a golden ball, and diamonds, all the stars of night, this book were worth them all. This is the most important thing we have as a Christian is the word of God, to put it in our heart, to study it. And we cannot overemphasize the word of God and how important it is himself. And Jesus is showing these disciples as he's speaking to them, he's telling them, hey, you need to go back to scripture. You need to see what the Bible says. You need to see what the prophets are saying. And then he does something astounding. They come to the city. They say the village, they say he's gonna, he says he's going to go on. They said, no, come, come into the house. We want, we want you to come into the house. Comes to the house, he breaks bread in verse number 31. It says, and their eyes were opened and they knew him. After all of that walk, after all of those miles, after many tears, no doubt, and a, a depressing situation, now Jesus has taken the word of God and shown them how he was supposed to go through these things, how he would be resurrected. And then all of the sudden, I don't know how he did it. I don't know how it happened. I just believe it happened because the word of God says so. All of a sudden, they see and they realize this isn't just some man. This is the Lord Jesus Christ standing here. What a great day what a great encounter they have with him we see their desperation we see their de demonstration uh, we see the demonstration then finally we see the determination look what happens after these people after they see jesus christ it says verse 32 and they said one to another did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened us the scriptures and they rose up in the same hour and returned to jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them. Notice the reaction of them. It says in verse number 29, if you want to go back there, that it was toward evening. It was getting late in the day, and it was probably unsafe to be on the roads. And so that's how they got Jesus to come to their house. They said, no, it's late. You don't want to be walking on. Come to our house. Stay with us for a little while. But as soon as they find out it's the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what hour of the day it is. It doesn't matter how far it is to Jerusalem. Hey, we got to get back over there. Uh, Peter's over there, and John's over there, and the other disciples, and the other women. Women, uh, we got to go tell somebody uh, we've got seven miles, we've got 90 minutes to walk, but we can get there because we've just seen Jesus. Uh, when they discovered the truth that Jesus was riven, risen from the grave, they immediately got up and they put on their sandals and out the door they went. They said, we got to get back to Jerusalem. They were determined to do uh, something for God. They were determined to tell everybody else, Jesus Christ is risen again. They had to tell the apostles. They had to tell somebody uh, what a wonderful day this was. You know, when we meet Jesus Christ, it ought to do something to us. It ought to stir us. It ought to start a fire in our hearts. It ought to determine in our lives. Uh, it ought to make us determine in our lives that we're going to serve him with everything we've got. When we meet Jesus, it ought to do something to us. And we ought to want to serve him and live for him. The Lord was stirring his heart through his word. Look what it says in verse 32. Again, we just read it. They said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? John Rice said, the burning heart is found when the blessed spirit of God makes the scripture real to us. Here they had just heard Jesus uh, describe and expound the scriptures concerning himself. And they had seen him in the flesh risen. And at that moment their heart burned and they wanted to do something for God. They were excited to do something for God. Uh, they were wanting to tell others about Jesus being risen from the grave. You know, the word of God ought to stir us. It ought to motivate us. It ought to make us determined to want to do something greater for God. These are different days we're living in. These are difficult times that we're in, no doubt. I don't need to tell you that. It's not like none of you have seen the news or uh, if you've been sitting under a rock, that's basically where you need to be right now. But, uh, you know, you, you know that things are, are different right now, but that should not hinder our determination to serve God. 
That should not hinder our determination to get close to the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope and I pray just like many others and probably most of you in here, if not all of you, I pray that our country and our world turns back to the Lord. I pray that uh, we're given an opening uh, to witness and to preach the gospel like we never have before. But before we can do any of that, we're going to have to come to Jesus and learn of him. They didn't go and start testifying of things they had not seen. No, they went to tell them that they had seen Jesus. They had been with the Lord. They knew that he was risen. If you're here tonight and you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, I'm not asking you to go out and talk about things you've never seen before. I, I'm, I'm saying that we ought to go out and tell people what Jesus has done for us. Uh, these disciples, they wanted to tell someone. They were motivated. It was one of the worst days in these disciples' lives quickly became probably the, the most transformative. We don't know what happened to these disciples after this. The scripture never says another word uh, about these two people. But from their reaction on that night, it seems like they were ready to serve God. No doubt there was a transformation that night. No doubt uh, there was a, a difference in what they believed or what they were going to do. And they, were, they went from being depressed and desperate to being determined and decisive. If you're here, you're listening to my voice and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, these are probably desperate days. Scary times that we're living in. No one knows the future. Uh, the truth is, this pandemic or this, uh, this virus that we're living through uh, is just making people consider that no one knows the future. I mean, any of us, we don't know what's going to happen. The Bible says our life is but a vapor that appeareth for a little while and vanisheth away. And we don't know what will happen from one day to the next. But just like these disciples, Jesus wants to show himself to those that are away from him. He wants to comfort them if, he, if you'll just come to him. If you're a child of God, these days ought to help build your resolve to serve God. I hope it does. We ought to be strengthened by God's word. Look at the strength these disciples had once they heard that this was Jesus. They had just made the trip seven and a half miles. I don't think I could make the first trip, let alone the second one. But they were determined to go. They were comforted by Christ's presence. Uh, we don't see anything about any tears on the way. Uh, maybe tears of joy or happiness. Uh, they were comforted uh, by Christ's presence. And we can be comforted by Christ's presence because he has sent the comforter with us. Let's go out of here and whatever way we can, let's be determined to serve the Lord in these days. Let's go out and proclaim, list what they proclaimed in verse number 34. Look what they said. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed. Say, listen guys, we don't care if you believe it or not, we've seen him. Listen world, we don't care if you believe it or not, but Jesus Christ lives in my heart. He saved me and he'll save you too. Let's go forth and say, Jesus Christ is risen indeed, just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus did. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word this evening. Lord, I'm thankful for the account that we're given here of these disciples who, though they were desperate, though they were uh, without hope walking back to their village of Emmaus, Lord, they met you, and through your word and through your presence, they were strengthened and they were comforted. Lord, I pray that you'd help those that can hear me, that you would strengthen us in these days, that you would comfort us by your presence. Help us to rely on the promises that are found in your word. Help us to uh, be comforted knowing that you're with us always. And that even in the midst of this pandemic, even in the midst of everything going on around us, you've not left us. You're still here with us. Bless us now. Speak to our hearts. Be with us in the invitation. We pray it in Jesus' name.